give a big hand clap to everybody watching online? Thank you guys for joining us. If you're watching because you live around here and you're thinking about visiting, come on, it's better in person, right, church? So come on, we want to see you. We want to meet you in our cafe. Last week, my friend Josh Clayton kicked off a new series called I Declare War. And Josh did a super job. Come on, let Josh know how much you appreciate him. Josh is out of town this weekend serving at our Emmaus retreat. And I know we have a couple of folks at that retreat. And so I'm grateful for them, grateful for Josh. I declare war. I want to start with a question, why? Like, why are we doing a series called I Declare War? I mean, it almost seems like it's ill-timed and a little insensitive since we have two nations at war right now. So why? My wife, actually, she didn't know that this was a series we planned. And so Sunday afternoon, we always talk if I'm going on a Sunday. And I said, hey, how was church? She said, it was great. But why are we doing a series called I Declare War when we have two countries at war right now? That's a great question. Let me answer the question. Simply saying, because you and I are in a war, whether we realize it or not. We're all in a war. The Bible gives us a number of verses and passages that indicate to us that fact. The fact that life's not always a playground. Sometimes life is a battleground. Have you ever battled in some way in your head, in your home, in, in, in your workplace? We are at a war, and in a war, whether we realize it, or not. And the Bible calls the Christian faith a good fight of faith. People right now, especially the last couple of years, they've been fighting over all kinds of things. And there's all kinds of things that we could fight about, but there is a good fight that we need to be engaged in. And it's called the good fight of faith. The choice to follow Jesus invites conflict into your life. If you want to know what opposition feels like, Give your heart to Christ. Follow Jesus and you'll learn real quick what opposition feels like. The moment that you say yes to Jesus and you become a Christ follower, you're attacked on three fronts. If you want to take notes, you can. You know, the Bible says 100% of the people who take notes in church go to heaven. So I'd encourage you to take notes. The moment that you give your heart to Christ, we all want to go to heaven, right? You're attacked on three fronts. Here's the first one, the devil. There is a real devil. He don't get a lot of air time in conversation and at a lot of churches nowadays, but there is a devil. Just get on 640 during rush hour and you will meet the devil. I I promise you that. The devil attacks you. The moment that you give your heart to Christ, you're attacked by the devil, by hell. LeBron James is viciously guarded for a reason. He's a threat to his opponent. And when you give your heart to Christ, you are attacked by hell for a reason. You become a target because the enemy is intimidated and threatened by you. So three three fronts. Number one, the devil. Number two, the world. The world. Now I'm not talking like things in the world like trees and nature, like birds that are attacking you when you come out of church after giving your heart to Jesus. But the world system. People who don't know Christ yet. Like your friends think you've lost your mind. I remember when I got saved, I had one friend who stopped me on the way out of church and said, you know you can't do this and this and this and this if you do that, right? So the world, your family. It's like when you give your heart to Christ, all of a sudden your family's like, I don't even know you. Like you're talking different. You're reading your Bible. You're going to church. You're getting up and praying in the morning. Who are you? Coworkers think you've lost your mind. So the world. And then the third front that you're attacked on is just your own sinful nature. It's like you have your own sinful appetite start rising up to be in conflict with you. Have you experienced war on one of those fronts so far in your life? Say amen. amen. We're in war whether we realize we're in one or not. Today I want to look at a passage, and I have to give props to my friend Michael Hamilton. He was on our trip, and the five of us on this trip, every morning we rotated who was going to share a morning devotion. 
And then we would pray together. And my friend Mike Hamilton shared a passage that, I mean, God, it, it's in my spirit, man. It, it's just in me. Mike's a student of Scripture, man, an incredible brother in Christ. And I don't know how many times I've read this passage, but I never saw what he pulled out of this passage. So I want you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 28. Turn your phone on, pull up your Bible app, open up your Bible, 2 Chronicles 28. Now, let me set the backdrop. Israel and Judah, they were once one nation. The nations have split. They're in civil war. And they've been at war with each other for a number of years. In this chapter, we see three crimes against humanity. And think about, even though thousands of years have passed, we still see these crimes today. So in this Backdrop, we have the crime of slaughtering innocent babies. We could translate that today to abortion. In this chapter, people are bringing their newborn babies and they're putting them in fire and they're offering them up to a god named Moloch. Crimes against humanity. One, killing the innocent. Number two, we find human trafficking in this chapter. Israel has slaughtered, slaughtered thousands of men. And they're bringing back their women and children as slaves. Three crimes. Here's the third one. They're implementing forced child labor. Three crimes against humanity. The armies of Israel, they're marching home and they've committed these three atrocities. They have an army and they have a innumerable amount of slaves with them. And there's this man who comes out of Scripture and he appears out of nowhere. He's only found two places in the Bible. His name is Oded. O-D-E-D. Some pronounce it Oded. Oded, like a T. Oded. He appears out of nowhere and he stands as this army is marching home. He stands in opposition of them. And I want to show you what happens. And today, my message is is on declaring war on fear. Declaring war on fear. Verse 9 says, A prophet of the Lord named Oded was there in Samaria when this army is returning to Israel, returning home. He goes out in the middle of the street. Picture this. He's standing in the double yellow line. In opposition to this army. And he says this. Put your hand on your heart right now. Come on, put your hand on your heart. Say, God, speak to my heart. Say, God, I give you permission to speak to me today. He stands in front of this army. Thank you. And he says, the Lord, the God of your ancestors was angry with Judah. And let you defeat them. But you have gone too far. You've killed them without mercy. And all of heaven is disturbed. Now you are planning to make slaves of these people from Judah and Jerusalem. What about your own sins against the Lord God? Listen to me. And return these prisoners that you have taken... For they are your own relatives. Now, we read these passages and it's like we just read through them like they're just some fairy tale story. But put yourself in this place. Three horrendous atrocities against humanity have been committed. And people are just watching this happen. But one guy says, "Now this ain't going to happen under my watch. And so he gets in front of an advancing army coming back from killing thousands of soldiers and one man stands up and he declares war on fear 
and war on the ungodly things happening around him. And he says, listen, if you run through me, you run through me. But by golly, I'm going to stand right now and declare war against the kingdom of darkness and tell you what you are doing is not going to happen under my watch. And where does he come from? Like how many of you, before I read that, had heard a sermon on Oded? I've never heard anybody preach on this guy. And he only shows up in two small pieces of Scripture. He's not a famous prophet. He's not Isaiah. He's not Jeremiah. To our knowledge, he has no political influence. But he stands up. And he says, if nobody else is going to stand up, I'm going to stand up for the things of God. And I'm going to bury the fear. And I'm going to say, the devil is not having his way in my country anymore. What an incredible guy. At some point, each of us have to make a choice. We'll find the courage to stand up for the things that are right, or we'll cower down and we'll just get in line and conform to this world. But does the Bible say, be not conformed to this world? You know the word conform comes from two words, conned and formed. The devil is constantly, this worldly system is constantly conning people and forming people into the pattern of this world. Get in line, be quiet, just submit. But at some point, all of us have to find the courage to pray against the darkness, to stand against the darkness. I'm not talking about doing foolish things. I'm talking about doing godly things. Come on, somebody. Declaring war on fear. There's a lot of things right now to be afraid of. I was thinking on my way back home, there's two years of a pandemic people can be afraid of. I was shocked in Mexico. I know our team had to be shocked. But for the last two years, you cannot leave your hotel room. You cannot leave your house without a mask on. And there are military with Automatic machine guns making sure when you walk into any building you have that mask on. I had a woman on a plane coming back. Almost touched my nose because my mask was under my nose. I thought, you will lose that hand in a heartbeat you touch my nose, girl. I ain't never hit a woman, but by golly, you better not touch my nose. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be touching my nose. <laughs> Two years of a pandemic. There's fear of, fear of the vaccine. Fear of not taking the vaccine. Fear of inflation. A, a crashing stock market. Fear of rising gas prices. All I heard from people while I was in Mexico is gas is going to hit $7 a gallon before summer. Gas is going to hit $7 a gallon before summer. A third world war. There's all kinds of things. You don't have to look far to find something to be afraid of. But here's the deal. Jesus told us that this stuff would happen. And all of this points toward His return. But here's the thing to think about. Jesus said, when I return, and He is coming. This whole book revolves around two events. The whole book, from Genesis to Revelation. The first event, when He came the first time. The second event, is when He comes the second time. That's this whole book. So Jesus said, these are the things that are going to happen before I return. But then he says this, he says, but when I return, will I find faith? Oh, come on, I'm talking about war on fear. Let's be people of faith, amen? Let's be people of faith. Oh, that was so weak. Let's be people of faith. He said, will I find faith on the earth when I... Return. I want to give you three, maybe four observations from this story. So here's the first one. God will use anybody. God will use anybody. Oded, he's not Isaiah, he's not Jeremiah, he's not Amos, he's not some of these well-known prophets, but he comes out of the darkness and he just stands up and God uses him. Which tells me God will use anybody who is willing to be used. See, I believe that anything that gets surrendered to God has unlimited potential. Like five loaves and two fish can only feed a few people, but when it's surrendered to God, it can feed thousands of people. 
right? Anything that gets surrendered to Him has unlimited potential. You think, listen, if anybody out there is watching, or maybe somebody's in the room and you haven't committed your heart to Christ, maybe, maybe you're really uh, happy with life right now. Maybe things are going good right now. I'm telling you, you get God in the equation and everything goes to another level. Come on. Everything goes to another level. Because when the favor of God is on your life, you can do anything. So my first observation is, God will use anyone who's willing to be used. Hoded wasn't a professional prophet. He didn't have a book in the Bible. No political influence. But he said, use me, God. He buried the fear. Here's my second observation. The enemy is a coward. <laughs> the enemy is a coward. We're going to see in this story that when he stood up, the enemy did exactly what Odin told him to do. One man. Now we know this was a skilled military. They had slaughtered thousands of soldiers. But this one man, the devil, is a coward. I've shared this with you before. Um, I can't give you something that I don't have. You know, my friend Buck right there. Wave at me, Buck. If I were to tell my friend Buck, Buck, I want to I wanna give you $1,000. <laughs> what would I have to have to tell him that? $1,000. I can't give something I don't have. Now the Bible, think about this with me. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now why can't God give fear? Because God's not afraid of anything. Now the Bible says God does not give us a spirit of fear. He gives us love. Why? Because God is love. It's full of love. And I want to say to somebody, God's not mad at you. God's mad about you. God loves you. God doesn't hate you. God's not full of hate. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen him. And what did Jesus show us? The love of God. So I can't give what I don't have. God doesn't give fear because he doesn't have fear. He says, I don't give you fear. I give you love. I give you power. Oh, you want to know what power is? How many of you guys have experienced the power of God at work in your life? Come on. And, and, and then he says, then he says, and I give you a peaceful mind. So why does he give us those three things? It's because that defines God. God is full of love, full of power, and full of peace. So if God doesn't give us love, who gives us love? The Bible says that fear... Is it from God because fear involves torment? Who's the tormentor? The devil. Now think with me for a minute. If I can't give what I don't have, and God doesn't give fear because He's not afraid, and therefore the devil gives fear, what does that say about the devil? He's full of fear. He's full of fear. So when God starts speaking to your heart, you're at lows. And God says, pray for that person right there. Hey, tell that person I love them. Hey, just go out of your way to do... And you're like, oh, I ain't going to do that. Let me give you another thing to think about. I was listening to a pastor the other day say, uh, if somebody came forward and they were sick and they had cancer and they wanted prayer, he said, most of the people... This is a pastor talk. He said, most of the people in my church would think, pastor, pray for them. And he said, the reason why you think pastor pray for them is you think the pastor is holier than you. Or his life is more perfect than you. But he said, the reason you don't have as much confidence is when you pray is because you know you like nobody else knows you. You know the thoughts you have sometimes that you shouldn't have. Things you say in the moment you shouldn't have said. Feelings you have in your heart that you shouldn't have. And so you let that lack of spiritual confidence keep you from being the person God's called you to be. Because you think the person beside of you is better, holier, whatever. Listen, because of the blood of Jesus, I am spotless before Him in love. I'm spotless before Him in love. 
So when God says, hey, I want you to do this, I want you to serve on the team. I want you to lead a connect group. I want you to do this. I want you to help out with the growth track team. I, I want you to, you know, whatever. I want you to MC. I want you to talk to that person at Lowe's. I was with my friend Kevin Rallin a few years ago. We were buying paint. And, and my friend Kevin, I know this is freaky and weird, but my, my friend Kevin is freaky and weird. Um, we're buying paint, and Kevin says to the girl on, on the other side of the counter who's mixing paint, he said, uh, what's going on with your leg? She said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm standing here. He said, my leg never hurts, but I've got this pain in my leg. And he said, I just felt like the Lord said that that pain is really a reflection of the pain you have and, and that I needed to pray for you that, that God would heal your body. And man, she just starts crying. And then he says, and the, devil, the devil's been saying that you're his, but you're not his. You belong to the Lord. Well, she starts weeping. And then she starts confessing her story, how she lived here, grew up here, was an addict, went to California, got clean, got saved, came back, got with some old friends the night before, got drunk, felt guilty for it. And he's reading her mail. And I'm like, dude, I came for paint. Okay, let's just get out of here. We got, we got people ready to paint. But he's just praying for people right and left. And, I'm, and we get back, and I'm like, dude, what is going on? How do you, what do you think? And he's like, man, God just starts speaking to me, and I just start going with it. I'm like, does that not scare you to death? Like, what if you, met, what if you miss it? What if you mess up? He's like, bro, I'm just going to bury that fear. I'm talking about war on fear. So when God pushes you to do something, and you feel fear coming on you, that's not your fear. That's the devil's fear. Come on, somebody, preach. I'm preaching good right now. Preaching good. Hey, it's not on my notes here, but here's my fourth observation. If you read 2 Chronicles 15, you'll find out that Oded had a son who was a brave man as well. Which tells me, my fourth observation, bravery's not always about us, it's about the generations behind us. Now, now look at this, look at verse 12. Now this is when Oded stands up and he, he buries his fear and he speaks to this army. The Bible says that some... Here's, here's my third observation. I, I'm, I'm, I'm off my notes right here. Give me a break, all right? I've, I've preached 14 times in the last seven days. All right? All right? Give me some grace. Here's my third observation. Courage is contagious. Look at this. Look at verse 12. When Oded did what he did, the Bible says that some of the men who were leaders, they stood up in opposition of those who were coming from war. And they said to them, you must not bring those captives here. Now, where were those leaders in the story before Odin got up? They were just sitting back grumbling. I can't believe our country's going the way it's going. I just can't believe people are doing the things they're doing. No, Odin said, listen, I'm going to be a voice right now in the middle of darkness. This ain't going to happen under my watch. And now all of a sudden, there's other people. They're emboldened and they're standing up. Courage is contagious. Fear is contagious, but so is courage. Come on, how many of you guys saying, the devil's not taking my country? Come on, the devil's not having his way in my house, not on my watch. Come on! Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Oded took a stand during a horrible crisis. This really blows my mind. I was studying not too long ago the word crisis. And I just want to say, never give up in a crisis. If gas prices get to $7 an hour, don't get, listen, don't panic in a crisis. I'm going to tell you why we should never panic in a crisis. The word crisis comes from the Greek word krisis. And I'm going to share with you what that word crisis means. It means, hit that next slide back there, guys. It means divine judgment. It means a strategic decision that produces a definite outcome or a turning point. That's what the word crisis means. I'm going to say it one more time. Divine judgment, a strategic decision that produces a definite outcome, a turning point. Here's why I'm telling you never give up in a crisis. It's because God has pronounced divine judgment. On anything that threatens you. That's why we never give up in a crisis. I don't know what I'm going to do. Have you ever had one of those I don't know what to do in this situation moments? Maybe you're there right now. I'm telling you, whatever you're facing, God has already pronounced judgment on those things that threaten you. 
Here's the other reason why you don't give up in a crisis. God will turn that crisis into a strategic move. A strategic decision that takes you from one place to another place. Come on church. Don't give up in a crisis because God has pronounced divine judgment on the things that threaten you. And God will take the crisis and He'll turn into a strategic move. Perhaps that's why the words fear not are the most repeated commandments in the Bible. Fear not. Some say, I've never researched this myself, but 365 times in the Bible we find the words fear not. That is a fear not for every day's fear. I'll share one quick story with you and then we're going to pray. In 1803, the British Parliament created a civil service position. It required that one soldier would always stand on the cliff with a spyglass looking for Napoleon and his army. And the, th- the thought was Napoleon would attack them, and so Parliament said, we've got to have eyes out looking for the enemy. And so Parliament created this position, and on a rotation every day, different soldiers would come and take position and look through that spyglass. He was to ring a bell when he saw Napoleon and his army approaching. Here's what's funny. For 142 years, there was always someone on post looking for Napoleon. 142 years. This is what politicians do right here. You know what I mean? It's like, are you not thinking at all? Come on. If you hold a political office, hey, I love you. Thank you for serving. I'm praying for you. All right. The job wasn't eliminated till 1945. Napoleon died 1821. (laughs) Do you see how foolish this is? So for all those years they were looking for an enemy that had already had judgment pronounced on them. They were dead. But they just keep looking. And, And I want to pose to you that I think a lot of us, sometimes if we're not careful... We will be conned and formed into the pattern of this world. And if you watch CNN and ABC and Fox and NBC, there's always something to be afraid of. But if we're not careful, we'll keep looking for an enemy that is long gone and defeated. I I was at a sports bar. It was actually up here at Aubrey's. And I was in the little bar area because it was packed out and I was eating lunch. And and, and I I got caught up. It wasn't even football season. I got caught up in this... NFL game. I just kept watching and one of my favorite teams was playing and and I got so emotionally connected to that. I was like, oh, what are you doing? What, What kind of pass was that? And I was so frustrated and I caught myself just being so wound up over this game and then it dawned on me. It's not even football season. Like this game's already been played and already been won. Why am I worried about it? The outcome has already been announced. And I'm telling you, whatever you're fearful of today, the outcome has already been announced. You're on the winning team. If you're on Jesus' team, you're on the winning team. Don't you give up. God's already pronounced judgment on the things that war against you. Come on, man. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's message. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, if today you're watching and you're away from God, you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, I'd love to pray for you. And right where you are, you can open your heart to Jesus and receive His grace and His mercy in your life. So if that's you, do me a favor right where you are. Just stop and repeat after me. Come on, bow your head if you can and and let's pray. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for going to the cross for me. For the wrong I did. I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to come into my life. I'm asking you to wash me inside and out. I receive your love today. I receive your grace. Thank you for a new start. In Jesus' name, come on, say with me. Amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer, I would love to celebrate with you. Do me a favor. Text the words, Welcome Home to 94000. When you do that, you're going to get a digital copy, a link to a digital copy of our connection card. If you'll do me a favor and fill that out, 
I want to send you a copy of one of my latest books, Making a New Start. That's what you've done, and I promise you it'll be a blessing to you. So until next time, be blessed. Can't wait to see you again. Welcome home.